Excuse the text to speech for this video, but I'm in college right now and have no privacy to record. But anyways, there's this YouTuber Alex Yard who releases these really interesting videos on music theory and games, particularly involving Sonic games. Just recently he published one going over wacky workbench from Sonic CD, and while it was as well made as his stuff usually is, there was a part at the very end that rubbed me the wrong way. So as a reminder, Sonic CD had two soundtracks, one for Japan and Europe, and the other one made for the US by Spencer Nielsen and David Young. Whenever Yard talks about music from CD, he specifically focuses in on the Japanese versions of each track, and gives a quick look at the US version during the credits. I don't actually have a problem with this, seeing as how the Japanese soundtrack was the original one for the game, and it's the one most people prefer. But to cut to the chase, his analysis of the American version of Wacky Workbench and his implications about the US soundtrack were so trash that, as a Sonic CD superfan who appreciates both soundtracks, I felt like I just had to say something. I get that he just doesn't like the American soundtrack, I mean he gives a whole story about how he played the game on the US soundtrack before the Japanese one and didn't like it, but for a series that seems so meticulously researched, going over chord progressions and exact notes, it shocks me to see him completely miss the point of the US tracks and make completely nonsensical claims, I'm not a music theory guy, but I am a hobbyist artist who does game development work, so I like to think I have a knife for game feel and such which I hope can establish at least some ethos in the face of Yard's wealth of knowledge about music. So let's go over some of his takes in order, and see what his interpretation is. But while partygoers danced through the night in actual USA, Spencer Nielsen was busy tuning up his guitar for that country's soundtrack. The bass line that starts off the song is one of those pentatonic riffs you bang out quickly at the beginning of a jam session with pals. Okay? I mean it's the very start of the song, having a nice simple, upbeat riff on the bass line works for having the song explode into its transition. Sonic starts each act, or in this game, zone, in a hallway isolated from the bounciness of the main area, so this simple muted noise is effective for this comparatively inactive space, prepping you to run or be thrown into the craziness. And hey! If it sounds like you're having a quick jam session with pals, that's sort of appropriate for the tone of the rest of the song, positively interpreting the factory as an energetic upbeat place. Yard also completely ignores the Wild West clicking noise at the start, hinting at the desert origins of the stage before the player is even aware of them. And for all your efforts, when you make it to the good future, you'll be met by hard labor. This sounds like hard labor. I suppose if you take the part completely out of context, you could, indeed, in this universe and this planet, possibly come to that opinion that it sounds like hard labor. But I'm not hearing any grunting, or jackhammers, or things falling apart, or dwarves whistling or something. It sounds more like pistons and steam-powered contraptions functioning without a hitch, banging and working together in rhythmic harmony, representing the order that Sonic has brought to this place, allowing the machines to get their work done freely. Just because it's machine noises doesn't mean it's hard labor. And if you look at the stage itself, there's still dangerous freezing pipes and shocking electrical currents, so it's still an active working zone with lots of mechanical parts moving around. And this is for the good future? Did Spencer mislabel the tracks in his final submission to corporate? What the hell are you talking about? Alright Alex, let's switch the tracks and see if it works out. These stutter notes on guitar sound cool enough, but they have nothing to do with anything. You're... you're trolling, right? Nothing to do with anything? Alright you all I'ma drop something you guys might not know about Wacky Workbench. When you touch the flashing checkerboard pattern, Sonic will actually bounce up. Yeah, I know, pretty obscure fact. Believe it or not. 
The stutter notes actually play into this obscure feature, giving a sort of bounciness to the guitar. So I'd say it does have to do with something. It has to do with wacky workbench. The other future track may have been mislabeled too, since Hawaiian luau's are often associated with desirable results. I'm not gonna pretend it doesn't sound like they're saying Hawaii, but come on man, this'd be like saying Court Squadron Presence sounds like a bad future theme because they're saying bad. <laughs> or that Palm Tree Panic Bad Future is about Romeo and Juliet. Not to start another Yanni vs. Laurel debate but to me it sounds like they're saying hey, hey, oh why? like they're lamenting the rusted ruins that the workbench has become. It makes more sense than Hawaii because there's no pronounced E sound at the end. Not like there's any official lyrics, and you know there really aren't supposed to be any, so my interpretation works just as well, and is realistically probably closer to Nielsen's intent. Note the emotionless way the voice says the line too, repeating it almost robotically. And of course, Yard cuts off the dissonant harmony that immediately follows it, which descends into a sense of hopelessness and even a little bit of fear, which I would argue gives the vocals a creepy context against the endlessly repeating guitar riff, making an almost maddening atmosphere. Wacky Workbench has gone crazy. Throw in some cowbell and some guitar noodling, and you have a song that was definitely completed in time for the seven week deadline. Okay, I'll agree that the cowbell is kinda funny. It does kinda work with the bell thingy in the background. But it probably would have been better as a siren. But if you don't like rock guitars, just say you don't like rock guitars. I mean I know it's just supposed to be funny and im nerd raging right now but also no bro, how are you gonna intricately analyze everything else then just gloss over one of the main parts of the song? Like I said at the start, I'm not a music guy, but the guitar solo section seems to be pretty solid in my eyes, it keeps up the energy, and has a lot of quick ascensions followed by descending sections, again highlighting the bounciness of the stage, but in a way that just feels more evil. Like Sonic is fighting against his terrain. When the guitar solo ends, it reminds you that unless he goes back to the past, it's a hopeless endeavor, before transitioning right back into the spooky vocals. This is a level that's supposed to be nightmarish and aggressive, with sirens screeching cause you done messed up. And the ghostly vocals combined with the guitar I just mentioned don't do that? Also. Notice how he uses the siren from the Japanese Bad Future as what the song is supposed to be. And this is where we get into the part that inspired this video. After this quick detour. Imagine if you bought Sonic 3 in 94, but Hydrocity Act 2 swapped in a totally different composition from Act 1. Uh, yeah, Carnival Night, Ice Cap, and Launch Base Zone would like to have a word with you, but anyways. Deeply at odds with the atmosphere created by the game's designers. Hataya and Ogata poured themselves into numerous revisions of tracks, taking direction from the very specific vision of Sonic's original designer, Naoto Oshima, who's also the showrunner of Sonic Superstars. For inspiration, they dove into current American music trends in hip-hop, New Jack Swing, and of course house music, pioneered by Chicago's own Frankie Knuckles, the godfather of the genre. But SOA had a fancy recording studio at their disposal, and the suits wanted to use the company's payroll. Enter the navel-gazing Dad Rock. It's definitely completed in time for the seven-week deadline. It's ironic that Yard uses the fact that the US soundtrack was rushed as a point against it, then proceeds to rush his analysis of it. Here's the thing. Nielsen and Young's job was not to reinterpret Hataya and Ogata's tracks, nor was it even to follow Oshima's original vision while the game was being developed. 
The game was finished at this point, so Nielsen and Young's job was to take what the game was, and provide an alternate interpretation. Sega of America knew that some people might be weirded out by the Japanese pop vibes and hard to decipher lyrics of Toot Toot Sonic Warrior, so Sega felt the need to localize things a little and make a song that's smoother and cooler, which is why we have Sonic Boom. While it might not have been necessary to totally replace the soundtrack, there's no reason why this alternate interpretation can't be just as legitimate as the original Japanese intention. It's not like they just randomly recorded a bunch of rock music and threw it on the ISO. But Yard is so married to the idea that the Japanese soundtrack is the only legitimate one, that he doesn't bother taking the time to understand what the American soundtrack was trying to do, and since most people, himself included, prefer the Japanese soundtrack, which I won't even argue with, it's totally valid, he definitely doesn't feel any need to discover it, and it makes for a nice story of those damn corporate suits and their dad rock, ruining the game's vision, to help justify your dislike of it. But if you look just a little closer you'll find that there's plenty of inspiration here. I'll concede that the Japanese soundtrack had more of it, with its fusing of genres and greater time in the oven, but the American soundtrack is no slouch either, and summarizing its sound as just being dad rock is extremely unfair and would be like if I summarized the Japanese soundtrack as just being techno babble. There was an album released in 1994 called Sonic Boom, yeah, which re-released some of the tracks from CD's American OST. Some of these tracks were extended a little bit and had extra touches, some of which actually made it back into the game's remaster. Like this section in Wacky Workbench Present, which adds this twinkly little synth. Not that it's super important, but still. But anyways, to go back to the point about inspiration, there's a little blurb in the notes for the album about how Palm Tree Panic's music was inspired by Pete Escovedo's Mystery. You've also got Mark Sterling crew with Armando Peraza and Bobby Vega on Collision Chaos and Metallic Madness, both of which I personally feel like have a really unique sound. Metallic Madness especially uses Peraza's percussion skills with its freaking bongos mixed in with the warped electronic sounds and wailing guitar like Little Planet's nature is desperately trying to break through Eggman's machinery. and it finally breaks through in the good future when it basically becomes Missouri from Sonic Unleashed. Stardust Speedway also has excellent atmosphere, taking time to marvel at the beauty of the stardust illuminating the night sky while also keeping up the ceaseless energy of the speedway and a jazzy vibe, fitting right in with the highway nightlife and brass that lines the roads. And don't forget about pastiche a female vocal group which absolutely kills it on Nielsen's tracks, whether it be hyping you up with the opening version of Sonic Boom, or making the closing version as smooth as hell way to close things out, or choking on the polluted air of titled Tempest Bad Future, or marveling at the wonders of Quart Squadron Good Future. Case in point, this soundtrack isn't just some hack job rock fart whatever, there was really a lot of heart put into making this interpretation of the game feel legitimate and well developed. And since the US soundtrack was made looking at what the game was, there are even points where I think that it fits the atmosphere of the zones more than the Japanese original, like with Court Squadron Bad Future. The Japanese track makes it sound like the place should be actively exploding and falling apart, but it's more so just run down and sad, which the Bad Future does a great job at conveying. Now, you don't have to prefer it or even like it, and not every track is a banger. 
I mean the game over and boss themes are totally ridiculous like we're fighting the forces of Satan or something, but I really do think the OST deserves more than a half-hearted glance. I know I'm rambling at this point, but while I'm at it, just look at Collision Chaos. If you're used to the party in Japanese soundtrack, going to the American rendition you're just like. What the fuck? But really take a second to look at the surroundings. Yes, the Japanese soundtrack fits with the bounciness and concept of the zone. But completely forget about it for a second and look a little deeper at the actual game's surroundings. The pink concrete ground is becoming overgrown with moss at certain points. It's evening with the clouds fading into the distance. You got these jaggedy looking signs glitching out and flickering. There's a lot of browns too, everything just sorta looks sturdy, like it's a decaying amusement park on its last legs, overrun with machines and tunnels of spikes. From that perspective, I don't think the American soundtrack's rendition is that crazy, and when you get to the good future, and the palette freshens up with brighter green colors and a super bright sky with full white clouds it's like the stage is taking a breath of fresh air, and you can literally hear it in the good future rendition. Now apply the same thinking to wacky workbench like I did earlier and you can come to similar conclusions. I know I got way off the topic of wacky workbench specifically in Alex Yard, but really, what I'm trying to say to everyone is, please give the American soundtrack a chance, and on its own terms too. I'm not saying that Yard is dumb or malicious or anything, quite the opposite, the dude is awesome when he's analyzing the Japanese tracks, pointing out a bunch of stuff most of us would never really even think about. But it was so upsetting to see him suddenly switch and make such brazenly obvious misinterpretations on the American tracks for this video, and I think it's because, like I said, he and a lot of other people are dead set on the Japanese soundtrack being the default, and judging the American soundtrack based on it. There's already been so much negativity surrounding Sonic CD recently, and now people are gonna latch onto Yard's opinion as objective fact and talk more crap. He's made jabs at the US tracks before, but this video in particular man. I just felt like was not good. Wait. I'm complaining about people spreading negativity around Sonic CD but now I'm spreading negativity and complaining about this. Crap.